My name is Brian Cowell. <clears throat> I was born in Chesley Street in County Durham and I have had a lifelong uh, <clears throat> love of traditional forms of entertainment, in particular song and dance. Um, and I uh, have been involved with that ever since I was 15. And there's no, there is no record in my family of any traditional music whatsoever. What happens is people who are enthusiastic about traditional music, usually it's because that they, their family has introduced them to it, uh, uh, grandparents or parents or uncles, etc. Um, but there was none of that in my family whatsoever. Um, and my father could never understand why I liked folk music. Um, but I was uh, enticed into the genre, for what I want to describe it as that, by um, children's radio. Right. On a Saturday, Uncle Mac. Okay. <laughs> so I'd like to say that that was the start of my uh, interest in, in, in this sort of music. And of course, a lot of the time it was Americana. <laughs> But uh, I then developed a great passion for tra traditional English music and subsequently music from the northeast of England. We don't really know <laughs> the okay. origins of the bear. There is a, a smattering of newspaper reports from the back end of the 1800s. And then there's the famous Sir James Fraser book The Golden Bough which contains a reference to the straw bear which was a letter which was written to him by the nephew of Sir Harry Smith who was a, uh, a military person who lived in this town of Whittlesea um, and his comments to Sir James Fraser was that he was in Whittlesea on the day for f and he hadn't been there for 40 years and he saw a straw bear and he was um, completely amazed when he saw this straw bear because he thought the, the whole event had been suppressed by the local police. And uh, accusing the, the participants for begging, which against, in Victorian times was against the law. In fact, it still is against the law. It offended the Vagrancy Act and uh, there was a suppression of everything folky in this area uh, because, in theory, because of that. I suspect it wasn't that that stopped them. I suspect it was the First World War. I moved to Whittlesea in 1979. I was a civil servant and we, they were opening an, an office in Peterborough and we just toured the area looking for somewhere to purchase property uh, and we happened to drive into Whittlesey uh, one Saturday afternoon and um, I came in via the North Bank which locally is part of a floodplain and I saw ice skaters actually on the ice rink outside you know and I couldn't believe it and as I drove into into town with my wife we drove up the, the front street and I said Whittlesey Whittlesey the name rings a bell um, and when I got back to Stevenage following this this preliminary visit I went through my long playing records and discovered a long playing record by Ashley Hutchins called Rattleborn and Ploughjack. And that describes traditional events which happened in this part of the world, in the Fens, and also on the other side of the country, in the Welsh borders. Uh, and there was Whittlesey mentioned, and I read the little bit about it and said, we're going to move there. And within six months we were here. Wow. And that's how it all started. Um, it was basically down to this long playing record by Ashley Hutchins. And then I uh, joined the Whittlesea Society. And uh, that year 
I suggested to them that they revive the straw bear. And they said, oh, yeah, go on then. And that was it. The bear stepped out on the street in 1980, in January 1980. It's a man dressed, or a person, should I say, dressed in a straw suit which was constructed together um, and is paraded and danced around the town and ex there is an expectation of a recompense of some sort of financial or um, food or drink contribution back. We don't plough up people's front gardens anymore. I would like to make the point at this stage, the burning of the bear came out of my head. There's no symbolic reference to it whatsoever. So forget about the wicker man. He doesn't live in the fens. <laughs> <laughs> the keeper of the straw bear, <coughs> he, he keeps the bear under control and the crowd at bay. So it is, it's important for him to make sure that the bear um, doesn't get into too much trouble. Uh, and he avoids, I mean, there was a very classic shot of one video I've seen of this year where he fell over a children's uh, pram but because the, the keyboard just wasn't quick enough to stop him walking into it. The visibility in the, in the costume is very, very poor. So you do rely on the keeper to look after the bear to make sure he doesn't trip over the curb, walk into things. Um, when I was, was in the bear, my biggest problem was actually little boys on their bicycles would come up and they would stop in front of you and look at you and forget they had a, a wheel behind them and the bear would move off and fall over the wheel. Which happened to me on a couple of occasions, um, thankfully without any serious damage to either the bike or the bear. But there we are. <laughs> on Rattlebone and Ploughjack, there's the reference to the straw bear on the last track. There's a reference to the straw bear, which is the um, which is the letter to Sir James Fred and. Uh, Ashley Hutchins with it, he got somebody to, to read this in a very sort of posh voice. And then when it runs out at the end of the dialogue, there's this rhythm and a tune. And it's George Green, Molly Dancer, playing the tune. Well, it's supposed to be, but it's not because it's actually Hutchins interpretation of the tune and it builds up and builds up and builds up and then goes into a this rather strange electronic distortion at the end but when I heard that I thought we're gonna have that tune <laughs> so I, you know, I spoke to my friend Pete Shaw and I said Pete, can you just do, because he's a muse, proper musician, I said, can you just write the, the notes down so that we know what it is? And, because I, I, I can't read music. So he did. And I said, right, we, and the following year, we put the tune with the bear. And it's been there ever since. And it hasn't changed that much. It has changed. It hasn't changed that much. It is still recognised now to be the Straw Bear tune. But it was actually a tune that was played by a, a, a melodeon player from Diddle Down. <laughs> and uh, I have heard uh, an original recording of him, because actually Hutchins got this, this the, the tune from 
old records of uh, that, that was uh, of the, the the very few musicians that have been recorded at the at the time and it tells and he got the tune and he sort of vamped the tune up. Um, so it's yeah that's that's how the tune evolved uh, into what is now universally known as the strawberry tune. There hasn't been a great deal of change to what we do. Um, we've enlarged it considerably. But it's more than a one-day affair. Um, and uh, fundamentally, uh, under the umbrella of the Whittlesey Society, we developed it. And I made a, a particular strong statement at the beginning um, that we should feed the Morris. So... Uh, f for the first four or five years of the festival, all the dance teams that came here on the day by invitation were actually treat to a meal, which was organised and produced by the Whittlesea Society and the, and the ladies within the Whittlesea Society. And it was a very simple affair of soup and shepherd's pie and, um, uh, and, and tea bracked, fundamentally. Um, and... From then on, it was that was a, a if you like, a, a welcoming to the dance teams that came into the town to support it, which at the very beginning there was only three. Um, and I saw it bit, a, a bit of a crusade as to actually indicating to local people what different forms of traditional dance there was from the country, throughout the country. Because I presumed I was going to be in a folk oriented area when I moved here, and it was a proverbial desert of folk music and song. And I've only met two, two people in the town who were singers, um, and they, they only had a couple of songs between them, basically. And it was quite clear at that time that uh, the traditional aspects of life the music and the interaction had had not disappeared, but it 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 had sort of gone subterranean, um, and it's only afterwards that when the interest to the event came more to the fore that people started to come forward and then getting involved in what was going on, um, so much so that there was dance teams in the town, which were made up of people from the town. Um, we've introduced a, a programme of um, <clears throat> professional folk style entertainers in schools, so the children actually can interact with live performances, nothing from the screen, you know, and different from, if you like, the the teaching element is just enjoyment, and that 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 was you know very important at the at the time it was actually saying, look guys, this is fun. There's there's children's dance teams. We had four primary junior primary schools, and at one stage we had four dance teams from those schools on the street on the day. Uh, there was only a couple. There's a there's a, a couple gone into to decline. But um, you know, there's still two schools produce a dance team on the day in traditional form. The addition of folk style concerts, barn dances. At one stage, we ran on the Saturday night after being out on the street all day. We ran three dances. A yeah, traditional traditional dance, a Cayley style dance, and um, Cajun. Cajun dancing, which was very, very popular about 15, 20 years ago, uh, and which is Americana. So, um, <clears throat> fundamentally, this is how the whole thing developed. And, of course, then we introduced the burning of the bear um, on the Sunday. And that was preceded by, uh, yet again, another folk-style concert, all homespun entertainment. Uh, just people that were there 
we said, oh, will you sing a song or will you play a tune or, you know, or we have a dance team, so we will do a dance display, you know, and this sort of thing. About 10 years in, we, 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 did, we thought we were unique. And about 10 years in, um, we discovered that there was a small town in Germany, in Oldenwald, called Voldern. And they had straw bears. And we thought, oh, that's interesting. Um, and so we contacted the group and we said to them, we'd like to come and see you. And they said, no, we'll come to see you first. So they drove across Germany and across Europe in a 42-seater bus to arrive on the Friday night to leave on the Sunday morning. <laughs> and they brought their bears with them. And so we'd arranged something that we would go back and revisit. So we, we, we went out. Uh, we went out in a bus, 52-seater bus, but we were there all week. And we had a fabulous time. And since then, there has been a great camaraderie between this town of Voldern and the Straw Bear group and our Straw Bears. And from then, it was like the opening of a book. All of a sudden, there we, we discovered straw people, uh, not necessarily bears, but straw images throughout the whole of the Rhine Valley um, and further across into Czechoslovakia and, and, and the like. And they're all interrelated customs which relate to the turning of the year. Um, and uh, they, can't, they, and uh, they fit into their, what they call carnival. Uh, now the carnival season runs from the 12th of December through to Shrove Tuesday, depending on what part of the continent you're in. So, but they, they come out and they've got wild and weird beasts. <laughs> um, and so, you know, going back to the Wicker Band to put him to bed completely, The Wicker Man was a film, it was a collection of small parts of British traditional culture all sort of sewn together in an ad hoc way. That's my view, my opinion. Um, and I, when I saw it, I was sitting picking out the different elements. Oh, that's from Padstow. That's from, from there. That's from there. So and that's, that, that, that was what the Wicker Man, to me, was. But uh, unfortunately, people seemed to be completely immersed in this burning of the image in the bonfire and this sort of thing. Which, uh, all we do was burn the bear so we can get rid of it, basically. It was either that or we take it down the tip and put it in the skip, you know. And people would say nowadays, well, that's probably the best thing to do with it because at least you're not creating holes in the ozone there. <laughs> What people believed in four or five hundred years ago and what they believe in now is, is slightly different. Um, yes, there is a lucky aspect to it. There is, you know, a good luck symbolism for the turning of the year. Um, and But you could relate that to a lot of British traditions anyway and European traditions. So it's not that unique and you know everything is a, a little bit subdued compared to what it was 200 years ago I'm sure of it I'm sure at the time it was the old boys out on town getting tanked up and you know really creating a great nuisance of themselves it's a little bit dare I say it, a little bit more refined now but Having said that, you've seen what the marketplace was like on the Straw Bear Saturday. If you'd come for the 40th anniversary, there was five times as many people there then. The place was absolutely crammed of just people wanting to be there. I don't think for one moment that blacking up was, was ever um, a, a snipe at, at coloured people. 
I think there was there's two elements to this. First of all, it was a way that youngsters are, and I'll say youngsters because invariably it was the youngsters, they could be disguised. They, uh, and the most convenient thing to find at the time was soot. So they would, they would put black on their face, but not necessarily in a, uh, a complete black face as, as per, you know, the black and white minstrel show, for example. Um, it was always just smudging and just changing, the, just changing your character. There's an element here of um, a facade. Uh, the straw bear does have this facade, but a person who puts makeup on to perform, again, is protected by the facade of his face or his costume or both. Um, the dance teams have sort of navigated the problem, I feel, to a long, long way to appease opinion by using different colours um, and it basically it, I, I, I can condone that aspect but I would never decry anyone who says no I'm putting black on my face and it's definitely not a slight at people who've got that coloured skin let me put it that way um, and fundamentally, you know, that's where I stand. The, the, the group, the straw bear group, will not dictate to any dance team how they should or should not dress or, be, or, or, or make up. So we, we're going to sit very impartially in the middle, on the fence, and say, we're inviting you to our event because we like what you do uh, and we're not going to ban you because of this element or that element. We just accept you are what you are um, and, uh, and, and leave it at that. Now that unfortunately upsets the, the people who, th who think that blacking up is uh, a snipe at people with that particular coloured skin. Um, I go back to, to them and basically say, well, what happens in classical Japanese uh, opera where the person has got a complete white face? Is that a snipe at white people? But no one ever seems to take that sort of option. Um, so really, you know, I've, I've got to say I've got to remain on the fence, but we're not going to dictate what a dance, how a dance team dresses. Um, dance teams have changed the colour on purpose so that they do not antagonise. Um, I, as when I went in the straw bar, I used to black my face just purely and simply as a form of form of disguise. But again, it was smudging. Um, I was once advised in Leicester not to put black on by uh, some members of, of uh, if I can call them a white dance team uh, and I refused. I just said no this is me. This is my facade. This is, this is what I am. Um, and, uh, later in, in my sort of performance uh, experience I changed my face um, to uh, a green man. Um, uh, not because of this reason, because I just felt it was more suitable to the character that I wanted to be on the street. Uh, and, and that was it, really. Uh, so, you know, the, 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 the nutters in Lancashire have always had black faces and they will continue to dance out like that because they believe it is their right. But their, their, their tradition comes from Spanish pirates. <laughs> A rather convoluted journey, but there we are.
that's that's just the way it is up from from Cornwall basically. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a it's a, a difficult subject, um, especially when national organisations in the country turn around and say, if you don't stop this, you're not going to get insurance from us. You're not going to be part of our group because it's wrong. And I would say that they were equally as wrong to 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 make that sort of statement because it was, it, in my opinion, it was never intended to be offensive. Fundamentally, I think, first of all, it's the first. It's the first major event of the year after New Year. So if we take out New Year, Christmas and New Year, and remove that from the scenario, the Straw Bear is really the, the first main organised event. There are other things happening. Plough Monday usually is usually just before Straw Bear. And um, the, for example, the uh, Gawthorn Plough Stots, always, their, their day out always clashes with Straw Bear. So it's very rare for the Plough Stots to attend Straw Bear or, or likewise to their event. Um, and I think it's purely and simply because it, uh, it is purely and simply the first major event of the year. Um, and yeah, we've, we've done a lot of advertising and telling the folk world what we're doing. Um, and, you know, that, that has, over the years, has proved to be uh, a benefit for the event. Um, some would argue that it's the downfall of the event because we filled the streets packed full of people who, generally speaking, drink too much. Um, but that, unfortunately, is a presumption which I sort of disagree with. Yes, there's going to be an element of that, but that could be any Saturday night. Um, and we do are very cautious about uh, alcohol, and how it's seen to be consumed. Um, we license the streets, which means that within our license area, there is no selling of alcohol. It's, if, you wanna, if you wanna drink, you've got to go to licensed premises. And that has always been the case as for Straw Bear, uh, in the hope that, you know, we, we are in a situation whereby um, the publicans quite, clearly can exercise their right of not selling to a person who's had too much to drink. Um, and uh, we do have a dialogue with the, with the publicans within the town and uh, they empathise with us and uh, but they want to make they want to make their money as well. So you know they, it's a tit for tat situation really. But yeah I mean that's that's why it's successful and I think in some respects it's just a, it tweaks the imagination of the locals and they thinking well yeah this is this is us this is important and you know come in world and see how we enjoy ourselves and it's very simple. I mean, this year it was absolutely dreadful at the beginning because it was a downpour of rain, but there was people still happy, smiling. And in fact, we had a meeting last night and the, the group were there. They said, yes, it was dreadful, but I thoroughly enjoyed it because we came back after the, the lockdown. There was a, a, a great escape from, you know, the, the, the dreadful times that we've been going through over mm. the last two or three years. I think the one thing that we'd, we can say about the COVID, it was a time to reflect. The biggest problem was the loss of people within the group. Not just with COVID, but with, with other things as well. This is a natural thing. And suddenly it's a, an awakening now. And I think this is what, some, what perhaps COVID's done for us. If in, in a positive way, a negative positive way, saying, look guys, 
if you don't get yourselves put your act together, this is going to die because you're all getting old <laughs> and you haven't recruited any young people. So I think this is this is something that we had a meeting last night and this was something that came out really quite pronounced at this meeting uh, was that you know we really need a group, not a lot, just a group of young people and when I say young people I mean somewhere between 20, 30, 40 uh, to actually come along and be committed to actually support the event and, and put it on. Uh, and I, I, I suppose it, we, you could argue that those of us who have been involved for all the time have been less than diligent here because we've just thought, well, we've got them running, it's always going to happen. And of course that isn't the case. You've got to work all the time to make things happen. I'll leave you with one last thought. Mm. The chairman of the Whittlesea Society, um, when I voiced the view that it might be a good idea to do it, retorted, well, I hope you're not going to fill the town with them left-wing hippies. Wow. <laughs> and, you know, that was... That was their view. Uh, it was something a, a little bit scary, as from their point of view. And then the following year, he says, "Oh, you're going to do it again, are you?" <laughs> <laughs> and then he turned out to be one of the staunchest supporters of the event. <laughs> <laughs> and family had his family there. Every straw yeah. there. Sadly, he's not with us anymore. Mm -hmm. But you know, every year the family came in, they would have a great family party on the Saturday night. Mm -hmm. They would go out and see the badger of the day and have a, have a party on the Saturday night. Mm -hmm. And not get involved with any of the formal mm -hmm. things. They were just, this was just their family affair. Right. And really that's, that says it, yeah. says it all.